Good afternoon and welcome to our Pocono Waters third uh, springtime lunchtime webinar. Uh, this webinar today is titled What is and what is not a case study on PA stream designation petitions and also how to write them. Our Pocono Waters campaign is unifying the community while educating citizens, business leaders, and local leaders about the importance of protecting exceptional value or EV streams, highlighting the many ways that clean streams and economic development coexist in a region known for its natural beauty and booming tourism. If you'd like to know inf more information about this campaign, please like us on Facebook. You can get involved by emailing Emily at Rinaldi, or excuse me, Emily, Rinaldi at penfuture.org and stay informed through the www.rpoconowaters.org. Hey everyone, thank you so much, Emily, for putting this together and for all your work with our Pocono Waters. Uh, my name is uh, Faith Zerby and I'm a scientist with Delaware River Keeper Network. Um, we are part of the wonderful coalition of folks that are part of our Pocono Waters, which Emily talked very eloquently about. And again, um, at the end, we'll have the slide and the screen to show the website as well, so you get a sense of um, the coalition and the different information about the, the campaign. So without further ado, um, I will get started. Um, again, we are the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I work for Delaware Riverkeeper Network, but we work with a coalition of many different groups, of course, including Penn Future. And here I have just a couple of the folks who helped put this webinar together. Um, because we wanted to talk about the vast experience in the Poconos of folks putting in stream petitions, that being mostly watershed groups, I'm highlighting um, some of them here, and of course, there are many more, um, but certainly um, people who've been working on this for, for many, many years um, do need recognition. And again, there's a lot of great templates out here. So if you're thinking about possibly um, pursuing a stream petition, know that there are many of us who could help you out with it and many different models um, so that you're not alone um, to help protect your stream and restore your stream and get those special designations. So. Again, as Emily said, this is our third uh, webinar. And the first webinar, Abby Jones uh, had put together, and it was very good. She went into some of the legalities of um, special protection streams. So I'm gonna breeze through some of these slides and just direct you back to that first webinar that you can get on our website if you wanna um, get into the, the weeds as it is with the regulations. But essentially the important thing for you to know in this case is we're focusing on the anti-degradation policy. Um, each stream in the state of Pennsylvania and in the nation has a designated uses. And I'm listing those designated uses here um, from warm water fishery, trout stocked fishery, cold water fishery, Migratory fishery is often something that many um, streams have just automatically, um, but we're really focusing today on these, these blue waters, these high quality waters, and exceptional value waters, which are the cream of the crop of the state's Pennsylvania streams. And again, watershed groups have worked a long time to get a lot of our streams upgraded. And here are just some of the stats. Now these stats came from Pennsylvania DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, last March. And you can see that we have about 86,000 stream miles in Pennsylvania. And of that, high quality stream miles are over 23,000. Um, I'm listing here existing use, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But again, we've got a nice solid group of high quality streams, cool, clean streams. And then in addition to that, we have exceptional value streams, but you can see here the number is a lot less. Um, you can also see uh, the EV existing use, if this is interim temporary um, interim protection while it goes through the regulatory process, we have about just about as much as the uh, designated use, which is really terrific. And that just shows the great strides of people um, in the Poconos and beyond in Pennsylvania who worked really hard to get um, streams upgraded. 
And we also highlight here the Class A and wild trout streams. Again, Abby talks about this in the first webinar a bit, but if you have um, wild trout in a stream, um, you can get designated for uh, high quality. And we will talk about the work that many of the groups and um, Fish and Boat Commission and a sister agency has worked on to get many different packages or bundles through the process. That's really helped the last few years um, to get some of those streams up to, up to HQ, which is a phenomenal thing. So <clears throat> what is a stream upgrade or redesignation petition? Um, those of us, you know, in the watershed world, we, we always talk about it being an upgrade. We really don't want a downgrade of water quality or water quality protection. Um, but the official way to talk about it is a stream redesignation petition. And over the last 20 years, and even longer than that, there's been many watershed groups and citizen groups who have formed, who document stream conditions and stream quality, and who really want to work to protect those streams in the Poconos and beyond where um, people are living and thriving and where they recognize the recreational value and just the value of living in a clean and healthy community. Um, here you can see residents, uh, this is a little bit further south, but here we see residents looking at the macroinvertebrates, the insects in the stream to determine stream life on a section of a stream that had a dam removed um, and we were kind of documenting how things were changing over time to improve with that. Um, so again, it's, it's been a long road and there's been this long tradition in Pennsylvania where the state actually has a petition process. So as a watershed group, you can petition um, for a stream upgrade, but you could do that as an individual as well. And over the years when looking at past petitions, sometimes you'll see one person named as a petitioner. And we'll talk about the pros and cons of that as we go through the process. Um, but it is terrific that in Pennsylvania, we have this petition process that anyone is able to do to get a better designation or protection for their local tributaries. So just some resources, because again, we're all eating lunch and you guys are all just kind of having, <laughs> having a little bit of break probably from your work day, but a couple of resources just to take note so that you know um, you can go and look at these incredible resources that give a lot of step-by-step uh, -step information. And the first is Penn Future Stream Redesignation Handbook. Uh, the last module of that was from 2009. It was updated from an earlier version and uh, Penn Future is working on an update of that in the next coming months too, but it's a really great step-by-step -step guide to take you through what you need to do to put in and submit a petition. And we're glossing over that a little bit today, but this is, this is kind of the, the guide to use if, you, if you're going to sit down and actually start writing it um, with your watershed friends. Another resource we wanted to point out is an, uh, something about anti-DAG related to protecting Pennsylvania's cleanest streams. This was from 2011, but it talks about anti-degradation policies and programs and recommended recommendations for improvement. Um, again, EV and HQ get us some protections, but we always want to work to, to get them stronger. But that gives you a little bit of basis and emphasis, too, that it could be a good resource to check out. Finally, the third resource we wanted to highlight is the effects of special protection designation. We call this the blue book. And this was done by a coalition of many different partners, um, all of which are on the phone and more, um, through the Pennsylvania, Can Pennsylvania Campaign for Clean Water. And this too gives you um, great step-by-step -step information. It can really help you if um, there are concerns about what an upgrade means. And we are gonna kind of go through a little bit of that here today too, um, just to whet your appetite on what an HQ or EV stream means and what it doesn't mean. This was from 2007. These are all available online and I believe they're all on the R Pocono Waters website. So why spend the time doing an upgrade? Well, it provides increased tools to protect those streams and the clean tributaries and all of the good stewardship of folks in the Poconos who've worked for many, many generations um, to keep clean. Uh, if you didn't get to see our second webinar, which is about recreation in the Poconos, it gives you a really great history about all of the amazing trout streams that we have and still have, um, and then all the historic um, recreation that was available in the Poconos and that we still have, but things have, have slightly changed too and been modified. But um, Don Baylor um, does a really great overview on that. So again, we hope you can check out webinar two um, when, you, when you have a chance. So 
the effects of going through the stream process are, are definitely well worth it, um, but it is a lengthy process. Now, what a stream petition is not, and, and we say this simply because um, it's sometimes what we hear is folks, particularly sometimes municipalities, will say, wow, we're really concerned that, you know, if we get an exceptional value designation for this tributary, we're not going to be able to do any kind of development. Everything is going to stop and halt. And that's just simply not true, and it's not accurate. Um, one case study of that, of course, would be Valley Creek, which is further downriver in the Delaware watershed in Chester County. Um, Pete Goodman and um, the Valley Forge Trout Unlimited worked for decades decades in the early 90s to redesignate Valley Creek to exceptional value. But for anybody who comes downriver to Chester County, you can see that Valley Creek has continued to develop and there's a lot of, um, you know, land subdivisions, highways, and everything else that have been developed since the time of EV designation. Um, but again, the whole point is that we are through HQ and EV requiring those developers when they come a knock in to essentially just uphold innovative standards and stormwater practices that make sense and that are just smart approaches that will keep our community's water in mind. It does not mean that they can't develop, they just are developing more smartly. So that's a critical thing and that critical piece to get out of that. If you talk to people or you become part of the OPW campaign, it's a key thing to just remind people about. So the benefits are huge. I won't read through all of these, but again, there's been a lot of studies on recreation and we've talked about that in our other webinar. Um, cleaner drinking water is of course important. If we have stronger standards, uh, the water filtration is not going to be as, as, um, as needed as it, as it would be if it was dirty, dirty rules. Um, we have reduced, or we have healthier diversity and that forms the base of the food chain. Um, lots of fish, so everybody who wants to go out and fish, you can't have fish if you don't have good clean water bugs. Um, things with climate change are another issue, right? So as we're dealing with more flooding because of the way the extreme weather patterns are, um, having, for example, riparian buffers that can be part of HQ and EV to protect those streamside properties keeps people out of harm's way, also protects um, the river from flooding, and actually cleans water too. So there are many reasons to pursue a high quality or exceptional value stream if you think your stream may be in the running for it. Now, I mentioned that blue book, and again, there's a really great table in the back of that, and there's also um, a lot of breakdowns of it. And again, a lot of our attorney friends can do a, a great job of talking about these things in, in the weeds. But some other just key things I wanted to highlight on direct benefits are related to funding that municipalities can get. If they're in an HQ or EV watershed, they can get funding for sewage treatments um, to improve their conditions and to, to improve their plants. The dirt and gravel road maintenance funding is another big benefit. If you have an HQ or EV stream, you can get um, money for that maintenance. And another big one that's coming up more and more, um, if any, you know, there's a lot of different issues with haz hazardous waste disposal facilities. Um, these types of facilities are barred from exceptional value water. So there are many other um, points to, to mention, but those are the key things. What Again, as I said, what happens with these primary effects of HQ or EV, and again, the first webinar goes into the weeds a bit on the regulations, but um, a developer or somebody who is an applicant who wants to do something just has to go through different steps and hurdles um, that they otherwise would not have to go through if it was not a high quality or exceptional value stream. There's an anti-degradation review, and in general, an individual permit is required instead of a general permit. And again, you can learn more about that later. So as I was looking at all of the streams that are in this list of ongoing petitions in the last few years, here we just selected a few from the partners who are up in the Poconos who've done terrific work over the years. And again, this just really goes to commend anybody in the Poconos who's worked so hard for generations upon generations that we still have these incredibly clean streams. Um, I wanted to mention Bonnie Smith, who would have loved to be part of this webinar, but she had a conflict. Um, Bonnie ha helped with the Upper Lehigh River petition as part of um, the um, Tobihane Taconic Watershed Association. 
and um, North Pocono Care. Um, and it's really just great that um, it's a really good model uh, petition that folks can see. And again, all of these petitions are available on the DEP website so you can see what they look like. Also, our partners at the Aquashicola Watershed Association, they have a petition that's pending for the Aquashicola a little bit further down in the region. Uh, there's a larger regional petition that's still pending but coming in pieces for the upper Delaware. And we'll talk about that a little bit, regional petitions versus segments. And then we have our friends and allies at the Broadhead Watershed Association um, with the most recent petitions with Cranberry Creek and Paradise Creek, which when you look at the dates, they got through a little bit faster than some of the other ones. 2013 to 2018. Um, but I will emphasize that that is fast. <laughs> so we'll talk about the way that we have to play the long game with these petitions. But again, I think for those of you in the Poconos, it just goes to show how people have been working a very, very long time. And even before this time of 2002, to, to pursue these long standing petitions to protect the stream. So if you're thinking about this, if you're thinking you might have a stream where you're saying, you know, wow, I, you know, it's very clean and has beautiful forests, maybe there's land protection or eased land that's been happening over the years, um, we encourage you to think about doing a petition. So we're going to just go through a little bit of the nuts and bolts for some of the key things. And again, I'll point out that Penn Futures um, Stream Redesignation Handbook is, again, that trusty guide to use if you decide to sit down and do this. And so some things to think about at the beginning, of course, is, is the benthic quality, are those insects in the stream diverse and clean? Are, do you have a lot of stoneflies and mayflies and caddisflies living in the stream? Are things looking pretty good quality? And again, we have a lot of wonderful watershed groups who either commission studies where they have experts go out to petition, or I'm sorry, not to petition, to survey, or we also have folks who um, use volunteer monitors to kind of get a little bit of a sense of what's happening, um, to know if it makes sense to spend some more money on, on sampling or not. The other thing to consider are softer qualifiers, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit, but these are these outstanding recreational um, attributes of the stream. And what we're finding in some places um, in the Delaware watershed, as streams get redesignated um, to a higher designation, those softer qualifiers are becoming more and more important and more and more in play to be able to actually get the designation that you're pursuing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. What about public support for upgrades? Now again, in the Poconos, we've had a long history of folks supporting petitions. In the past, we've had conservation districts sign on and support to various petitions. In many cases, if a watershed group goes out to do a petition, you know, they're meeting with the municipalities to kind of give the municipalities a heads up. Sometimes those municipalities actually say, hey, we want to support it. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they sit on the fence. Um, and sometimes they might fight it, but it's good to know your watershed and your area, which again, watershed groups tend to do. So you kind of will know if it's a good time or a ripe time to get people um, engaged and in, in, this, in this type of process. And then can you commit to seeing the petition process through? You know, those of us who've been doing this for many years, we say we're going to, you know, grow old. Um, till the petitions are completed in some instances because it is a multi-year um, type of adventure. This is one of the reasons why it's great to have many different partners involved because people may come and go in different positions. Um, so you wanna kind of make sure that you have somebody thinking about it for the long term and uh, you have enough people that are kind of paying attention so that when things are active, um, it's important. As Bonnie Smith says, she says, you know, you submit the petition, but your work is not at all done at that point. Um, it's a big part of the petition process, but you, you want to be there for the long haul. And then the last thing just really is don't be afraid to get started. Sometimes we've had incredible watershed groups. I know a few right now that have been working on a petition on and off for over a year, right? They pick it up, they start um, putting information together, um, then they drop it. So I would just encourage you to get a petition in. Um, there's an administrative complete thing and you can always put supplements in after the fact. Um, it's not like once you put a petition in, you can't add anything to it. So sometimes um, if you tend be, to be the kind of person who wants to have everything be perfect, 
you can, you know, you can give yourself a little bit of a break or your group a little bit of a break just to get that in, get something together and um, get the ball rolling for the regulatory process, which is, a, which is a long one. And again, Abby talked about that in the first webinar. So some of the things that you're going to be having to do if you decide to do this petition is you'll have to delineate the watershed or the stream segment you want to redesignate. Um, you're going to want to check various tables. And again, we've talked about this in past webinars, but not to get too far in the weeds, but you want to possibly go to this website, the DEP website, and check out the different tables that show different iterations of stream redesignations. The last thing you want to do is put in a petition for a stream that, say, might be already in the running for, a, for an exceptional value or high-quality designation. And in that case, you'd be going to an ongoing, the existing use table. And again, I won't get too far in the weeds. The key thing is just remember, do a little bit of homework and look at the DEP website and also just let us know if you have any questions because we navigate this all the time. So we're very happy to help to make sure that you're, that you're pursuing something that makes, makes sense at that time. The other thing you'll have to get together um, is a list of the point source discharges that are in the watershed. Now, DEP also has the ability to help you with that. Um, and I believe now, with a lot of the different types of interactive mapping online, there are also some other great tools that you can use um, to get that information. Um, but don't be afraid to ask you know, your contacts at the state to help you get that information as well. Um, and again, depending on where you are in the watershed, this happens to be just a screenshot from an upper Perkiomen petition, which is further downstream. There were a lot of discharges. Um, a lot of the, the Pocono streams, you, you're not running into you know, long lists of potential polluters and dischargers. But you'll have to be getting that together um, for the application for the petition. Next, and this is a big one, is really help gather and collect information and data that's out there. Um, in the past, when Delaware Riverkeeper Networks put in past petitions, we ask, you know, the conservation districts, and we know certainly like in Pike and Monroe County, they've put a lot of resources and time and energy into wonderful stream monitoring programs. So you have a really great wealth of information in some of the districts in in the Poconos. Um, so you definitely want to look at look at that information. Fish and Boat Commission, as I talked about nearer the beginning, um, again, are there trout in the stream? Is it a class A stream already? Um, is it, are there wild trout that are reproducing? This is a really big, big one um, to make sure you talk to Fish and Boat and see what the latest and greatest information is um, for, for the stream if they've been out um, doing assessments. Then you have private entities, right? The Academy of Natural Sciences would be one, Stroud Water Research Center would be one, Drexel's doing a lot of monitoring right now. Um, so you want to reach out and tap those academic resources that might have uh, data and information. Um, in our case, with some of the petitions we've worked on, Stroud was a big impetus for it. We knew that they had been doing a lot of monitoring. Um, we knew it, knew it was rather vigorous. And we thought, hey, you know, the bugs are looking pretty good, so let's move forward with a petition. Um, so again, I, I can say that in the DRWI, which is the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, there's certainly a lot more data out there than there was um, 10, 15 years ago. So be sure to tap into that and tap into those networks. Along those lines, I did want to mention the DRWI Help Desk. This is a very exciting tool. Um, we're in fact using it right now for a Tohicken um, supplement to the petition, but you can see the blue up here gives you a website. And right now, at least through the end of this year, and if perhaps it will go longer, if you need help mapping resources or kind of getting a sense of the watershed, this help desk is there to possibly help you. Um, there's a little application form, um, but they are looking to help anybody, at least within the Delaware River watershed, um, who might need these types of services. It's a really nice um, service to tap. And then, of course, all of your local planning, conservation plans, and comprehensive stormwater plans, and anything on eased lands is also really important. If you're in an area um, like the Poconos, where you have wonderful conservation trusts that are preserving um, lands, um, using public dollars and private dollars and leveraging all of that, that's a really critical piece 
for the petition and something you want you want to highlight it really shows that the community cares about those uh, watersheds and preserving the land that will only make the the water quality better and this of course is not an exhaustive list but it gives you a feel for how to collect and gather information sister agencies of course are the other ones delaware river basin commission u.s geological survey um, dcnr that's the department of conservation and natural resources if you have state parks in your watershed area um, those are really important things to point out state game lands through the pennsylvania game commission Again, and most of those places now have conservation plans, which allows you to note that as an important part of a softer qualifier for petitions. Now, we're not going to get too in the weeds here, but again, um, I was talking earlier about, hey, do you have really good insects? Are there really good bugs? This is the key way that the state agency currently looks at um, a stream to determine if it's clean enough to get an HQ or an EV designation. And they go out and they sample, and then they sample a reference stream that has a high score to begin with. And if you want to have a high quality stream, you need about an 83%. If you want to have an exceptional value, the, the um, candidate stream, the stream that you're trying to petition, needs to have a 92% of the reference stream score. Um, these are pretty high parameters, but you guys are lucky in the Poconos because a lot of your streams actually meet these designations. Um, and then, as I said before, this Fish and Boat Commission qualifier of Class A wild trout is really, really critical. And you can see many, many bundles of streams over the past two years go through the process to at least ratchet the stream up to high quality. Um, once you have high quality, um, you're able to then possibly look at other qualifiers for exceptional value. Now, if you didn't have the insects, the other thing you could look at is the water chemistry, chemistry qualifier. And we know a lot of volunteer monitors, uh, you know, do some of these readings. A lot of them don't do dissolved lead or dissolved or arsenic, for example, but some of them, like the oxygen and the temperature, they're, they're often key things that, that volunteer watershed groups do. The key thing here is we have one group that I know of over the years, and we must mention them, there's the Tinicum Conservancy in Bucks County who pursued the water chemistry qualifier to an amazing degree, to be honest. Um, the insects weren't getting the scores that they needed, so they spent a lot of time and money and energy um, looking at these qualifiers. Um, and they met the qualifiers about 98% of the time, but DEP requires a 99% of the time um, limit. It's a very, very high bar to reach. So I'd encourage you to think about this before you go down that road. And again, that's just something as you talk to us or as you, you know, as you talk to people in, in the, our Pocono Waters Network, you can get a sense that this would be something you could actually achieve or accomplish to figure out if it, if it makes sense for your stream. So as I was saying, um, you know, if you have the insects and the water chemistry, that's a shoe in. Um, but those other softer qualifiers in blue are the ones that we've really been pushing the last couple of years. Um, and so I'm not going to read through all of them, but essentially they are important indicators that are beyond the bugs and beyond the water chemistry. And this is where we say, just put in everything with the kitchen sink. Um, list everything that makes your stream special and makes your area special. And sometimes this can be seen in the region as well, which is one reason sometimes to do a regional petition instead of doing maybe a very small stream segment. If you feel like your, your small stream segment might not have um, like the right insects or the right bugs, you may just want to look at your petition more regionally within reason to, to kind of show other different outstanding qualities. Um, this is a big one right here, outstanding national, state, regional, or local resource water. Um, you know, when you think about this, some of these have a little bit of wiggle room in them, but when you look in what DEP has been accepting, um, you want to kind of look at successful petitions to see how DEP is interpreting this information um, so that you do the best job you can at putting in that petition or supplements. Um, 
we talked about wilderness trout streams before, um, exceptional recreational significance, right? Um, think about all those areas um, in the upper Delaware, for example, that are really special for recreation with the water gap in those areas. So these are all things that you would be listing. So a lot of these tips um, I had gotten, you know, just from folks, John Hoekstra from Green Valleys Association, um, Bonnie Smith, um, who I mentioned prior with Pocono Care and other watershed groups. Um, these are some of the tips that they had for successful upgrades because um, they've been there and they've, they've had success. Um, again, we can't reiterate enough, don't be afraid to get started. Um, don't have analysis paralysis, which I know sometimes I have. Um, just, you know, get going with it, um, put in a good um, petition, and then add supplemental petitions over time. These supplements are really important um, because, you know, new information comes about. Um, there might be new eased lands in your watershed or new MS4 plans for stormwater. Um, things have kind of ratcheted it up over the years, so you want to be engaging and sending that information across to DEP on a regular basis. You might think that DEP, it's on the onus of them to be looking up all of this information, but we found that's just really not the case, especially with um, short staffing. Um, it's gotten much worse in staffing over the years, so it's important and it would behoove you and your group to work together to get that information in so DEP is aware, and then it's part of the record as well. And again, we call those supplements to the original petition, and that's why never be afraid to get started because you can always add information um, after the fact. The DEP biologists are happy to, to help you with that. Another key thing is forming diverse partnerships. This is just really important. Again, this goes to the, lo the longevity of the petition because the petition process can take five years, 10 years. In some cases, there's still petitions languishing from 1995. Um, the, the Tohicken is an example of that, a very long-standing petition that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you, you, you want to be there for the long haul and having vast amounts of partners involved can really help do that. Everybody's watching out for each other, um, keeping everybody in the loop with things. Another big one that a lot of the watershed groups do is they communicate with the local governments. They give them a heads up. They let them know, hey, you know, we're going to be submitting a petition, you know, and by the way, don't think it's going to stop everything in the township. It's a really important key part because sometimes the municipalities, again, are hearing from developers or those who may want to um, develop in the area. Um, they're kind of using scare tactics to make them think that exceptional value or high quality means they will never be able to do any type of development. And again, that's just false and plain outright wrong. So it's important to engage them, use the blue book that we talked about um, to just show people what, what the designations really mean in the way of protection, smarter, innovative practices, not stopping it. Grassroots support and political support is also key. So if you can get your local legislators who often don't hear from us um, to support a petition, in a way, um, supporting a petition is not, it doesn't have to be an adversarial request. So in some cases, we found that the local legislators are happy to support clean water. And I'd say that's increased. Uh, you know, it certainly should be increasing with our finite freshwater resources. So, um, there are sample letters, for example, in Penn Futures um, guidebook to show you how to just, you know, write a little sample letter, a page. You don't need to go into the weeds with legislators. Um, they don't have a lot of time and a lot of energy, but if you send them a sample letter of support, they often will slap their, um, their logo on it and their office letterhead and get it off um, to DEP and you can submit it with the petition. Also, as I mentioned, most of the petitions, at least the, the ones from the last, I'd say, 15 years, are available on the DEP website. So you can go on and you can see petitions and you can also see the DEP draft reports that are in response to the petitions. Um, the one that keeps getting highlighted, if you think you want to put a petition in, is Upper Lehigh Petition. Again, this is one that North Pocono Care had put in. And it was one of the first ones that was using those softer qualifiers um, and really strategically looking at that beyond just the insects and the water chemistry um, to get special designation. And by far, Pocono Care was successful, and it's a model that I certainly used on other petitions, and I know many of us um, 
in the R Pocono waters have done the same. So it's a good one to it's a good one to to access and look at. So in closing, um, we are here to help. Um, I hope that I've given you a bit of an overview and a little bit of a taste. Your head might be spinning a little bit, but do know that we are here to help. Um, Emily's um, information is here as well, and you can certainly get in touch with any of the allied groups with our Pocono Waters. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Emily now to, to close out, and thank you so much for your time. Sorry about that, everyone. I didn't realize I didn't take myself off mute. Um, so thank you for joining the webinar today. I just wanted to let everyone know the webinar was recorded and it will be located on the R Pocono Waters website within this week. So we are going to take questions now. The way that we are going to do that is that there should be a Q&A section 